Welcome everyone to the Rockville Senior Center for the first Rockville 11 televised 2019 vote by mail election candidate forum hosted by the League of Women Voters of Montgomery County and moderated by co-president Diane Habino. Good evening. I am Diane Habino of the League of Women Voters of Montgomery County and I'll be moderating tonight's forum. And I'll be moderating the forum tonight and it will be broadcast live by Rockville 11. The League of Women Voters is proud to announce the celebration of its 100th anniversary this year. We are dedicated to creating a more perfect democracy and have been doing so since 1920 when the suffrage amendment was finally passed. The League will continue this mission into the next century as well. We are a nonpartisan political organization. We do not support any candidate nor any party. We do, however, encourage active participation in politics by all residents in our community, and especially voters who are informed about the candidates and the issues because voting is both a right and a responsibility. <laughs> Tonight there are 16, 15 candidates in this year's election. 13 are running for city council and two are running for the mayor's seat. I'd like to explain the format. We have split the council candidates into two groups so that they have an opportunity to be seen on stage. The second group will come up on the stage after the first one is finished. And then the third group will be the two mayoral candidates. We're on a tight schedule and we want to give you a good idea of who your candidates are and hear their opinions about Rockville issues. This forum will consist of questions from the League of Women Voters and from the audience. Audience question cards like this one are being collected by our League volunteers. So if you have a question, please write legibly and raise your hand with the card so that the questions can be collected. To the left here, we have question screeners. They will make sure that the questions are appropriate for the office, they are not personal, and they are not duplicates of questions already asked. Each candidate will have up to 45 seconds to respond, and at the end, each candidate will be given one minute to close. We have two timekeepers in front. They will notify us when the candidate has 15 seconds left. Can we see the 15 second sign? And after 45 seconds, they must stop. But candidates, you may finish your sentences. You don't have to stop in mid-sentence. We will have a three minute break between groups. So candidates, we ask you to exit stage and the next group to enter stage in a timely manner. And audience, we're going to need your help too. We're not going to have applause until the end, please. And please silence your cell phone. Okay, let us, let us begin. I'll introduce the first six candidates for county council. We have Mr. Littlefield, Mr. Lee, Ms. Mulligan, Mr. Godfrey, Mr. Masters, and Ms. Pittman. The first question, and you will be given 45 seconds to answer. And we will start with Mr. Littlefield and go down. Rockville's star attraction is the town center. Turnover, however, is an issue. How should the center be supported? By the businesses there? By the city? What is your opinion about how to keep it a vital source of pride to Rockville residents? Mr. Littlefield. Sure, thank you. The town center is absolutely very important to our cities. It's 
to me, it's the number one thing for, for our economic welfare as well as the quality of life that we, that we enjoy. Um, part of what's happening with, with retail and stores closing down is something that's happening all over the United States. Uh, so it's not unique to our city, and no one's figured it out yet. No one knows the future of what's going to happen to retail. So in this kind of an environment, we need to be doing as much as we possibly can. We need new, idea, new ideas. We need lots of new ideas. And we need <clears throat> as many people as possible and to bring them in. One idea I have in my last 15 seconds is we need to instate moderately priced commercial units similar to the moderately priced dwelling units so that we can keep mom and pop stores and even nonprofits and minority owned businesses in the town center when some of these places redevelop. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lee. I, th I, I agree that the town center is very important to the life of Rockville. Um, I think we need to partnership with uh, the different entities that are involved including those uh, individual businesses. For example, I spoke with some of the business owners. They talked about how the rent prices are a lot higher than the ones across the street. And so we need to work with these um, businesses and also get the um, customers or the clients to go through these town, town centers and um, ask for their opinion on how we can revitalize it. Ms. Mulliken? Yes, I've been going door to door for the last three months and this subject came up, people would say to me, what do you stand for? What is it you want to change? And one of the first things I said to them, which relates to the town center, we need to have free parking after 5 o'clock and on weekends. Every one of those voters just gave me the thumbs up for that. It's not just the people around town center that's concerned about town center's vitality, but it's the rest of the Rockville. And one of the things that I want to see happen is that the master plan that was approved years ago for the 60-acre town center master plan gets approved and that the city doesn't have any roadblocks for letting that happen. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Godfrey. Thank you for that question. The, um, <clears throat> the first thing is we have to have an honest, honest conversation about the town center. What are, what are our, our threats? Uh, number one, we have $60 million of bonds for parking. Two, we have a library that was intended to be an anchor store, and it's not. We have VizArts, which only, uh, we only receive a dollar a square foot uh, for rent. And uh, one, per the ULI report, one of the three legs that are missing is our small business. And so we need to utilize the VizArts, maybe the Dawson's, in which we gave a microloan of a half a million dollars, and, and now they're going out of business at the end of the month. Sounds like a nice gift. So we have to use these spaces to bring our home-based businesses um, to the town center. These small businesses, doctors, psychiatrists have clients, and they're going to support the town center. Thank you. Mr. Masters. Town center is my number one issue. It, it, there's a variety of, of issues that need to be looked at. One is the initial size and design that limits it from being a, a larger center. We're also, um, we have the retail in Crown and Rio and Pike and Rose now that are competing for customers. But the, the number one issue that I've seen, and I've, I know several of the restaurant owners, personally, is, is that they just can't survive there because of the rent. And so the biggest short-term issue is dealing with federal realty. Thank you. And Ms. Pittman. The frustration from residents all over town is very real, and it's causing people to feel unwelcome in town center. We need to remember that the original purpose was as a neighborhood services center. It required a gym, a grocer, a, a salon, uh, a library, things that people need, and it is doing that. Uh, the question is, do we continue in that direction and add an urban rec center, a pop-up senior center, request federal realty, find more services such as a uh, dog groomer, um, small hardware store, or do we want to change town center into a shopping and entertainment venue? Clearly, the ULI report needs immediate attention from, this, from City Hall and from us as residents to talk about the future of this place, the central place that we're all very proud of and like to enjoy together. Okay, thank you very much. Now we'll move on to another question 
We know that transportation is always an issue, and we, you all know that the plans are in to widen and expand I-270. Do you agree with Governor Hogan's managed toll lane idea? How should the expansion take place? What would be your input to this idea? And we will start with number six, Ms. Pittman, and go this way. Okay, thank you. There are some things we can do without actually widening I-270, such as directional lane changes depending on time of day. Overall, I think that money is better spent on mass transportation, on strengthening metro and strengthening metro buses. It's better spent put into uh, pedestrian safety issues, to better sidewalks and crosswalks. Um, as well as bicycle lanes and things that help people get where they need to be without a car. Um, I believe that the city, most people in the city feel very strongly that I-270, widening it is not a good idea. Our city has advocated against it and I agree with that position. Thank you. Mr. Masters. So in answer to the question, do I support Governor Hogan's plan? No. I've come from Virginia where, where they put in the toll lanes on 95 and 395 and then 66 and it's just not worked out. It's created more choke points and it's just very difficult for people that can't afford to pay the tolls during the, the high uh, traffic volumes. To me, I, I drive it a lot for my work and you really need to resolve the choke points of, of American Legion Bridge and the two lanes to Frederick. Okay, thank you. Mr. Gottfried. Yes, the, we are very close to the Woodley Gardens um, neighborhood and College Gardens neighborhood. And one of my legislative goals is to advocate against the eminent domain for our Rockville property owners including right down the street here in Nelson Street, the Woodley Garden Shopping Center, where those businesses are concerned about their property being taken by eminent domain. When I ran for Montgomery County Council at large, one of my suggestions was to first start with a short-term plan of having reversible lanes in the morning and in the evening. That would be the first step. The second is the issue that even if you widen I-270, although uh, Frederick needs to be widened, you still will have backups from all the exit points. Thank you. Ms. Mulligan. I support the plan for Hogan, transportation plan. I have talked to a lot of the people, and especially those who also kind of oppose it. They oppose it for certain reasons. Some of the things that they've been told is that the property would be taken. That is absolutely false. I've had problems with information being given to the public that's not right. What I agree on is that if the widening happens, Governor Hogan has said 30% of the toll money would go to mass transit, which a lot of people want. Some of the things that, that Susan said are things that the county and the city can do without the state money. The state money should be for all of the problems that we have all the way down, up and down the corridor, because you all know that there are a lot of people that are employed in D.C. and they're coming down this way and they need help. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lee. Um, as I canvassed, I also heard a, a lot of uh, concerns about the, this project, and so I think these voices must be considered. Um, but as a city, I think we definitely should explore other modes of transportation. Um, I believe our mayor, Noon, has um, pushed for various circular studies to um, kind of run around our city, and these are ideas that we need to explore more um, and to get off, uh, get cars off tra uh, the roads. Okay, thank you, Mr. Littlefield. My first comment <coughs> is that Governor Hogan should worry more about attracting more corporations to Maryland rather than Virginia so that we don't need to widen 270. A lot of that's because people live here and they have to go commute to Virginia and drive every day and use 270. We need better policies at the state level to get corporations here in Rockville so people live close to where they, where they work. The second thing is, I don't support the widening of it. I believe in smart growth. Uh, I think it should stay the way it is. The reason people want to widen it is because there's people that live in Frederick that work down here. 
the people that live in Hagerstown work in Frederick, and so on and so on. All we're doing by widening it is contributing to urban sprawl. I also agree with the alternative transportation ideas. I think the city can, can help directly in some of those. And I also think the city can think of some work reside policies so that we can give incentives to employers to, to hire people who live here locally. Okay, thank you very much. Um, continuing now with questions from the audience. We spoke about town center. A lot of it was about the economic development and support, but what about high density housing? Would you support more housing near town center to promote the use of public transit? And for this answer, I would just like a yes or a no. Would you support more high density housing near town center in order to encourage more use of public transit. And we'll start with Mr. Gottfried and go this way and around. Yes or no? Well, we have a lot of high density in town center right now, yes so uh, no? the answer is uh, no. No, okay. Yes, but where are you gonna put it? Okay. No. Mr. Littlefield. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Mr. Lee. No. Yes. Okay. So you've heard their opinions about high density housing. Um, another question, and this will be 45 seconds. It takes a little longer. And we'll start with uh, Ms. Mulliken. If elected, how will you work to fight climate change in Rockville? Big question, but it affects all of us. So if elected, how will you work to fight climate change in Rockville? 45 seconds. Okay, like all other questions, I believe that all of Rockville should answer that. It should not just be four or five people on the council. I think you need to have public, public hearings, but before you have public hearings, you need to get some real facts to the, to the voters. One of the problems I see is that there's a lot of misinformation out there. And before we do any plan, it needs to be analyzed. And I, I think that we need to be careful how the money is spent in that before you make those decisions. Okay, thank you. We're going this way. Mr. Lee, you're next. I think we need to encourage uh, people to use alternative modes of transportation, get cars off the road, um, encourage people to walk, bike, as well as um, protect our green space. Um, we need to have continue the balanced growth make sure that our green space, residential areas, and commercial areas are balanced. Okay, thank you. Mr. Littlefield. Yeah, I have <clears throat> several things to mention there. We, we do need to, within the city, protect our park space, and within the park space, we need to promote more wilderness. We have a lot of areas where it's just grass and lawn that no one uses. Why waste all that lawn mowing time and energy and gas cutting that when no one uses it? We should reduce that and replace it with wilderness. We do need to promote alternative transportation. We need to keep looking for LEED certified buildings when we redevelop. And also going back to my idea of the work reside policies, one of the worst things for the environment is they have to commute for an hour. Maryland has the longest commuting times in the United States out of all 50 states. And we need to work as a state and here in Rockville on the city level to reduce those. And so we really need to look at policies to keep people closer to their jobs. Thank you. Ms. Pittman. The first thing we need to do is get to work on protecting our tree canopy as well as our green space. Um, we also need to make sure that people have a good shot at being able to work here in town and not have to commute. Sprawl, as Charles said, is uh, very dangerous or very bad for the, for the environment. Uh, we also, whatever we decide to do with Redgate Golf Course, it needs to be master planned to be sustainable. We either need to leave it alone as park space or whatever we build there needs to be uh, planned as a sustainable, environmentally conscious uh, development. Okay, thank you. Mr. Masters. This is a big question for such a short answer. The, the, most people are looking to government to direct what we do because we can do a lot of things on an individual basis, but it really takes a much bigger plan to make these changes that will help us survive in, in the environment in which we live. Um, one of the things I spoke before the council a couple years ago when they made a change to the master plan, and that took away 
what could have been bike lanes and lanes for all these other personal vehicles or personal equipment that we're seeing now. Okay, thank you. Okay, one more question and then we'll go to closing statements. Sorry, I thought I asked you already. Sorry, go ahead. Thank you very much for allowing me to answer this question. Important question. Um, <clears throat> I'm looking at a very long, long range plan, probably 20 or 30 years. And uh, we need to look at alternative sources of energy. Uh, for, example, for example, requiring solar panels on all of city of Rockville buildings. Uh, converting our police vehicles to electric um, cars. And also increasing in our parking uh, charging stations. Uh, one of the ideas that's being passed around, again at the, the county council level, is the possible installation of a monorail like we have in Seattle. Uh, and uh, also, I've talked about having trolleys uh, in the city. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry I cut you off. Um, now we'll move to closing statements by every one of you. And we will start in the order that you started with Mr. Littlefield and go down this way. So. Mr. Littlefield, and everybody has 60 seconds. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm running as an independent candidate, not part of any slate, not beholden to any special interest, not dependent on any incumbent to advise me. I already know how this city works. For the last 10 years, I volunteered my time working with city staff and mayor and council on planning, zoning, economic development, and other issues. If elected, I will sit in the same chamber where I currently serve as a planning commissioner. In my role as a planning commissioner, I have earned the respect of those who have worked with me. I have listened fairly to both sides of every case. I have cast votes that impact the people of this city and that require careful listening and deliberation. I have reviewed and approved new development, and I have helped draft the master plan and vision for our city 20 years from now. Our master plan is still taking shape. It is my hope that once voted into law, it represents a vision of progress and prosperity for our town centers, quality of life for our residents, new ideas, new solutions, and development based on citizen input. I also bring expertise in the areas of finance, governance, and budgeting. If you vote for me, I will continue doing what I'm already doing to help you, the people of Rockville. Okay, thank you, Mr. Littlefield. Mr. Lee. Um, good evening. I'm an attorney with Social Security and Administration. I was a prior trial attorney in the state of Florida. Uh, throughout my legal career, I held various leadership roles, which I was a decision maker. Which made me effective. What made me effective was my ability to welcome experts or just ordinary people coming together to work with each other, to share ideas, and to ulti ultimately come up with solutions. I listened to all their voices and their views, and I learned from each other, each individual, and I did my best to come up with this outcome that everyone can agree on. As as your council member, I will do my best to facilitate and encourage all of us to work together to move Rockville forward. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Lee. Ms. Mulliken. I'm Brigitte Mulliken, and I'm running for the Rockville City Council because I have a solid Rockville citizens background and the experience to represent all Rockville citizens in a fair manner. I want to continue to make Rockville a great place to raise a family and to set down the kind of long-term roots that I have. I have lived in Rockville my entire life, raised my daughter in Rockville, and have been involved in my local community, school, church, and city government for 40 plus years. My goals are to make sure the city of Rockville is fiscally responsible and good communications are made for significant budget commitments, to treat all Rockville neighborhoods equally, give clear guidance policy to the city manager, get businesses and neighborhoods involved in cleaning up all of Rockville's properties. It will keep the property values high and make all of us proud to live in a clean and vigorous city. I have the qualifications and credentials needed to represent all citizens of Rockville. I understand the many and varied decisions that impact our daily lives. You can finish your sentence. I finished. Yes. Oh, you finished. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Mr. Godfrey. Good evening, Rockville residents. My name is Richard Godfrey. I want to thank you for coming out tonight, and I also personally like to thank the League of Women Voters for hosting this debate on National Voter Registration Day. I'm asking for you to leverage your vote by mail for Richard Godfrey. As a longtime resident and a certified public accountant practicing in the city of Rockville for over 29 years, I will bring my leadership, experience, and vision 
to the council. Also, I am a proven community activist, and I am well acquainted with the issues of our city. I am not a newcomer to Rockville City politics. If elected, I intend to add value and quality of life to Rockville by one, preserving our parks, especially Redgate Park. Two, if the state decides to widen I-270, I'll be advocating against eminent domain for Rockville property owners. Three, create a sustainable plan to address future growth and increased traffic. To learn more about me, please visit my website, www.votegodfrey.com. Thank you, Mr. Godfrey. Mr. Masters. I'm running for city council because I believe that the city council needs some new ideas that may make things more, more valuable to the different communities. Talking to many of you, I've really been surprised at how many people in Rockville have lived here 20, 30, 40 years. There was a gentleman that came up to me that I talked to. He's 97 years old. And I was just amazed at the, that. And there's such a variety of diversity in the neighborhoods that we have. Each one seems to have its own character. And I'm really impressed with that, and I really want to push to keep that in place. I'd also like to thank the League of Women Voters. They're instrumental. They've been instrumental for years in promoting democracy in this country, and I thank them for doing this. Thank you very much. Ms. Pittman. Thank you. One thing I've learned from Rockville residents through my community involvement is that we all love our city and want Rockville to continue to be the place we choose to call home. As three-term president of the East Rockville Civic Association, I listened to the concerns of my neighbors and successfully collaborated with the city to make sure that the character of our neighborhood as defined by its tree canopy, walkability, and diversity would be maintained through a well-thought-out set of plans created through an inclusive, democratic process. It's also a plan that embraces the future. I, the process I put into place strengthened our neighborhood, and I will bring that same collaborative, consensus-building leadership with me to City Hall, along with the practical knowledge and skills to follow through. Together, we will sustain the city we love through well-managed growth that enhances our quality of life and the lives of Rockville residents for generations to come. My professional experience in the public realm and dedicated service to my community with strong leadership spanning both make me the right person to serve as your council member, and I thank you for your vote. Okay, thank you very much. Hold your applause. This will conclude part one of our candidate forum. Coming up next, we will have the remaining seven council candidates on the stage. As we take a break to prepare, here is some election news from Rockville 11. vote by mail? How do I register? Is the voting system secure? Many of you may have asked questions like these about this year's vote by mail election. The Board of Supervisors of Elections are working to make sure you are in the know before, during, and even after you cast your ballot. Head to rockvillemd.gov election and click on View Frequently Asked Questions. And to be even more informed, you can also sign up to receive election alerts and reminders by texting Rock Votes to 888-777. Rockville will make history and conduct the first vote by mail election in Maryland on November 5th. historic vote by mail election is just around the corner. Ballots will be mailed to registered voters on or before October 11th. And we want to make sure Rockville voters know that there is not just one way to cast your ballot by mail. Once you received your ballot, select one candidate for mayor and four candidates for council. 
place the completed ballot in the prepaid envelope and drop it in the mail. Bring it to the drop box. You can also drop off your completed ballot 24-7 in the secured drop box located at City Hall. Bring your ballot to the vote center. On election day, you can bring your ballot to the only vote center here at City Hall and fill your ballot out in person. Remember, ballots must be received by 8 p.m. on election day, November 5th, and postmarks will not be counted. For more information on Rockville's vote by mail election, head to rockvillemd.gov slash election. Welcome back to Rockville 11's first televised candidate forum. It's hosted by the League of Women Voters of Montgomery County. I'm your moderator, and I'm co-president of the League of Women Voters. I'm Diane Hibino. We've heard from six earlier council candidates, and now it's time to hear from the remaining seven candidates to take the stage. I will name them, but please hold your applause until the end. We have Ms. Griffith. Ms. Ashton, Mr. Perkins, Ms. Feinberg, Mr. Prashela, Mr. Miles, and Mr. Hedrick. So let's begin with the questions. And we're going to do different questions so you don't hear the same ones. Um, another area, we talked an awful lot about town center, but another area that is a um, kind of an attraction for Rockville is the former Avery Road golf course. What should be done there? What are your ideas for this project? And we'll start with Ms. Cuddy Griffith. Hi, yes, I, I believe that Rockville going forward, we know we need 10,000 new um, homes by 2040, but we also need the green space to go with it. So I would like to preserve as much green space as the golf course as we possibly can. When the property was first bought, it was a farm, and they sold off part of it to be the Redgate Industrial Park, and they used that money to make the golf course with it. And so there might be an opportunity to put in something that the community really needs and make the money then to build all those fields that we need um, and keep the green space. I mean, I'm a Boy Scout family, so we, we want to keep our green space. We're known for our parks and rec in Rockville, and we want to keep as much green space as we can and preserve the golf course. Thank you. I'm sorry, I forgot to say it's 45 seconds. With the timekeepers warning you at 15 seconds and then stop, you can finish your sentence. Ms. Ashton. Thank you. Uh, the, the Redgate Golf Course has been a source of pride and discussion here in Rockville. Um, I do understand that there is a report coming out that's going to have some uh, excellent suggestions and there may be um, a call for ideas on that. Um, I will be listening to the residents, and I also want to leverage the data to see what is needed here in Rockville. Uh, personally, when I think about it, I think that it would be fantastic to have some green space here in Rockville. I know that um, our space within our 13 miles is limited, and we want to make sure that we honor that. Also, consider an amphitheater, and if we are going to consider housing, I would look at veteran housing. Okay, thank you. Mr. Perkins. Thanks. Uh, and first, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters and everybody who came out tonight. Um, I don't think the city should be in the golf business, especially with all the competing golf courses around, including public golf courses. I see four uses for the land. First, I do think part of it can be used to help alleviate the housing crunch that's coming over the next 20 years. Uh, I see a portion being set aside for at least 20 years part developed as parkland and part undeveloped as parkland, especially uh, the deer population needs room to, to walk and, and be. Thank you. Thanks. Ms. Feinberg. Thank you very much. Having recently toured the Redgate property, I had a first-hand look at the beauty that is there, but there are many uses that we have to consider. I would like to see housing for veterans, but I'd also like to see housing for persons with disability and see if we can replicate the property that is currently being done on Monroe Place for Main Street. There's a real nexus between those vets who may be suffering from PTSD and also those who may have special challenges and needs. I'd also like to look at housing for the missing middle. 
I would consider an amphitheater, but most important, I want to listen to residents. I believe we have to have several pu public hearings. We need to also hear what we will receive from our request from information, put it out for a public or P3, and see what we get. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Pashela. Thank you. Um, the next mayor and council will authorize a master plan process, and, and that needs to be followed faithfully. Personally, we need ball fields in that part of the city. Uh, just because of its terrain, there will be probably 30 to 40 acres will have to stay natural anyway. Uh, I support housing there. I also look at Redgate as an asset. We have King Farm Farm said, for example, 30 years in city hands, nothing's being happen, happen out there. We can get some, uh, some money for part of that land to, uh, to uh, support 10 to $20 million of development for a uh, King Farm Farmstead, but also to, to help uh, finance an attraction for our town center. So we gotta look at what we can do at Redgate, but also what we can do looking at it as an asset for the rest, for two big problems in the city. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Miles. Thank you all for being here. Before I have grand ideas about Redgate, I'd really like to sit down and talk to the folks at Redgate Farms or the north end of uh, East Rockfield, people who've been living next to the park. I live next to the park myself. And I like staring out and seeing the trees. I think there's some great ideas that have been proposed as a veteran. Well, certainly, I'm going to be in, in, in support of veteran housing. But again, speaking with our, our people who live there first and foremost to get their ideas. I also like biking out there. I take the trail, ride my bike to need, like Needwood, like paddle boating out there. So I do like the fact that we have lots of green space and would like to preserve a fair chunk of it. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hedrick. Oh, yes. Uh, I've talked about Redgate a lot as I've gone around and knocked on doors in the city, about 5,000 of them now. Uh, there's a couple things I think we need to do for Redgate. As Mark mentioned, we've got about 40, 45 acres there that's green space just topographically. It's going to stay that way. The rest, as someone mentioned, we need some parks and fields on the east side of town. Uh, I'd like to see things like a splash pad. I have two kids. I'd rather not have to drive to Germantown to find one. Uh, other things that we can have there, the amphitheater is a great idea. I think there's a lot of space for amenities there. Also, it backs up to Taft and Goody. I think there's some opportunities there, not only to make Redgate environmentally sustainable, but financially sustainable as well. I think we're going to need that to build and preserve the amenities that we're going to have there. Okay, thank you very much. Um, continuing with development, there was a question that came about Rockshire, Rockshire Center and its mixed-use development plans. And there are neighbors um, wondering what might happen to the current infrastructure that's there, um, the pool and the church parking, uh, for example. What decisions should be made regarding infrastructure in any of these development ideas, infrastructure that's already there? Can you give us some ideas and your opinions about what to do because growth is part of natural living in all parts of this county. We'll start with Mr. Hedrick. Specifically with Rockshire, I think that, that that piece needs, something needs to happen there. It's been empty and abandoned for quite some time. Uh, the community needs amenities. I've gone around and talked to folks there. We do need to pay attention to the infrastructure. Transportation is particularly important right there. The roads aren't very large. Mm -hmm. But if we're going to have anybody come in and turn that in from something abandoned to something useful, we're going to have to think about mixed use because that's, what being, that's what's being built now. And so I think we need to go to the community. I think we need a good plan, and then we need to push it forward. We can't sit there and tread water on it anymore. Okay, thank you. Mr. Meyer. I think we've learned a, a great deal in terms of community projects and when to get community input. I was recently at that meeting about the soccer fields at Julius West, and people are up in arms because it seemed like it was a fait accompli. Similarly, when talking about what to do about this, uh, this particular shopping center, getting the community involved early as they have done, at the, the meeting at the church was, was a very good first step. But in talking to the people that live there, there seems to be an overwhelming majority of folks who are, certainly don't want much in the way of townhouses, but there are a number of aging individuals who can't get to the grocery stores like they used to. So to what extent we can bring services that the community there could benefit from after listening to them would be my, my, um, where I would support. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Prashela? In 2014 and 2015, I walked every street in the city, and when I walked onto Rockville Village, Rockshire Village Center, it was stunning for its emptiness compared to every other part of the city. Um, the, th the thing is that the neighbors have some leverage because the zoning doesn't quite fit what the developer wants to do. 
so the the developer has to go through planning commission and all that and the neighbors are going to have input but i think the neighbors should be looking at what they really want i mean the the swim center that that area it's not accessible ada wise there there can be some uh some uh you know, benefit from a development there. The the church next door can get some benefit from the parking. That can all be formalized now. So I think uh, to to fill that empty space with with some townhomes, some mixed use uh, is a good idea. But the the neighbors should uh, really think about leveraging their power. Thank you, Ms. Feinberg. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, while I don't live in Rockshire, it's probably a mile away from my from where I live. I did frequent that when it was a very robust shopping center. And what do the folks want over there? They want to have a community gathering space as they always did in the interior of the Rockville Giant Shopping Center. I believe we have to honor the agreements with the Korean church that's over there as well as with the Rockshire Swim Club for their tournaments and sufficient parking. So any project that would come forth would have to incorporate those agreements and honor them. Uh, in addition, there would have to be sufficient egress both on Hurley Avenue as well as Wooten Parkway because they are both heavily traversed and the community wants to make sure that they can preserve their neighborhood quality. Thank you. Mr. Perkins. Yeah, Rockshire is a perfect location for the type of community-based center called for in the 20-year plan, mm -hmm. uh, a place that could support mixed housing. Uh, but also commercial activity and become a community center as long as the city commits to providing that community gathering space and providing walkable, bikeable infrastructure to get there for all neighbors within a 15 to 20 minute walk. Thank you. Ms. Ashton. Uh, I think Rockshire has been waiting for work to happen for a while, so I think that one, we need to see some action there. I do know that Rockshire is also a really good example of community activism at its best. I think the community has been very engaged and outspoken, and I think as a result, the developer has been coming back and making some changes, and I, so I, th I just wanna say that your voice does matter when those projects do come up in your neighborhood. Um, I think that uh, the honoring the parking needs that they have is really important. Uh, there's a already established need for um, the church as well as the swim pool. Um, I also think that there could be some amenities brought there uh, in terms of some of the mixed development that the uh, developer would provide. Thank you. And Ms. Patty Griffith. Yes, I, I walk around the Millennial Trail and go out to there. I also attended both of the last meetings about the Rockshire Giant site and, and, and got to sit at the tables with the community and hear what they were really thinking about it. The city brought in consultants and they had a couple of maps where they had some little bit of commercial, they had residential, they had these beautiful public spaces and everyone was dreaming about what kind of public spaces that they'd like and of course they wanted a Carmen's. Everyone here would know why they want a Carmen's. It's a great community gathering place. So I think they do have its own commercial. They can't put the residential in. They need permission so the, the residents in that whole area can get you know, what they want and make it work for them. And that's the kind of city we have and I, I love talking to people and going out in all those neighborhoods. I've been out there talking on every street and I, I, I hear differing opinions. Some people don't want any commercial. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, now we'll go to the next question. This is an issue that's in the news often and that is the movement of migrants and other immigrants to not only Montgomery County, to Rockville, to all parts of the United States, including the Midwest and parts that have not seen immigrants in a while. So my question is, what is your opinion about Rockville being considered a sanctuary city? And please explain your answer. Do you believe that Rockville should be a sanctuary city? And why? And we'll begin with Ms. Feinberg. Sure, thank, you. thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I need to set the, set the record straight. Neither Montgomery County nor the city of Rockville are sanctuary okay. cities. And the definition of a sanctuary fit city is very vague and ambiguous. You can Google it and hear many different claims. What I want to say is Rockville is a very welcoming city. We welcome everyone regardless of your uh, nationality. Over 30% of our residents are foreign born and we celebrate that. In addition, uh, the Department of Correction and Rehabilitation really processes anyone who is arrested for any minor infraction, but our city police already have the policies and practices that they will not cooperate with ICE 
for a minor infraction. However, you, we cannot prevent ICE from coming into our city. Yes, thank you. Mr. Prashella. Thank you. Um, I'm one of those who voted for the Fostering Community Trust Ordinance. But before I would vote for it, I, I demanded that the term sanctuary city be stripped out of it because there's no such thing as a sanctuary city. The federal government come, can come into the city anytime they want. Um, what, what it does is we formalized a process that was an unwritten policy. Unwritten policies get you in a lot of trouble. They get you in lawsuits. They don't protect the officers. When the policy is an official city policy, the officers and the city staff know what to do. And if there's a, ever a lawsuit or an issue stemming from it, it's the city that defends it. It's not going to be a, an individual police officer. And, and we needed the clarity in an ordinance uh, and, and instead of having this unwritten rule that no, nobody could repeat. Thank you. And Mr. Miles. In the Navy, I was deployed on a humanitarian mission. I worked in El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, then to Cuba. All the children I've taken care of and their families never want to leave. They're fleeing violence and persecution. And when they come here and they need help, just like Chief Brito said last night, we want them to be able to access help. It's no different from when people come to the emergency room. The reason I'm late, I had to work late today. When people arrive there, I'm not asking whether or not they have insurance, what their country of origin is. We want them to present their, you know, if they're in active labor, we have to take care of that patient. If they come in with a broken arm, we take care of that patient. If, if somebody's broken in somebody's home, we want them to report that to the police. And that's what the Fostering Community Trust Act is and that's why I support it. Thank you. Mr. Hedrick. Uh, I absolutely support the Fostering Community Trust Act. Like someone said, more than 30% of our population is foreign born. I want them to be able to come. I want them to be able to use the services that we have in the city. I don't want them to, someone to check their papers when they come to sign up for soccer. All right. We've got, uh, we, we need witnesses and victims to come forward. That's something else that the Fostering Community Trust Act does. All right. And, we're, and again, as someone said, we're not a sanctuary city. Immigrants benefit our community. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Cuddy Griffith. I think the Fostering Community Trust Act, Trust Act keeps everyone in Rockville safe. It keeps criminals off the street. We teach our kids something's wrong, you can go to the police for help. And that should be true of all of our neighbors, that they should be able to go to the police and report when bad guys are doing bad things. And our police will cooperate with ICE if it's an extreme circumstance and they really need to do that. You know, other countries ag aggressively reach out to skilled immigrants. They want immigrants to come in because the way you build businesses with entrepreneurship and startups and all those new ideas, and they come often from immigrants and they rejuvenate areas. So I'm glad that welcome, uh, Rockville welcomes our immigrants. I work for an organization that provides free legal immigration help. If you can't afford an attorney for immigration, they can do, we have legal clinics and we can help people work themselves through that legal process. Thank you. Ms. Ashton. I've heard this issue quite a bit um, going through and knocking doors, and I've heard that there's a lot of misinformation. Um, you'd be surprised what I'm hearing. Uh, I think that there is some misunderstanding that if a person commits a criminal offense and they're convicted, that they would not be uh, turned over to ICE. There wouldn't be coordination. And my understanding in talking to the county folks and state is that that would happen. Um, at the same token, we need to think about safety as well as being able to um, have folks feel free to engage with police without fear. Um, I do believe that is something that is important that we need to preserve in our city and we have to have community trust. Thank you. Mr. Perkins. I moved to Rockville in 1999. The city I know has always been an international city. It's always been a welcoming city. It's always been a city that has benefited from the people here. I know my city and my house and my family would be much less and much smaller without immigrants. Quiero ser el candidato por todo Rockville y quiero ser el candidato para toda la gente de Rockville. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, one more question. It's something that um, we kind of applaud because Rockville is doing this for the first time and that is voting by mail that all of you will be involved with very shortly. So we would like to know your thoughts on how this voting by mail should be evaluated after the election. Should there be some process in place for continuing voting by mail? How would it, should it be evaluated? And we'll start with Mr. Pashela. When we, um, 
authorized vote by mail, and it was a unanimous vote to do that. Um, there was this extensive discussion on how do you know it worked, yes or no, and it's not as easy as did your voting percentage go up, yes or no, because did it attract more uh, uh, younger people? Did it attract more people who feel isolated or marginalized? So there, there, that was a big discussion. So um, I do believe the Board of Supervisors of Election have taken that under advisement and, and they will be uh, evaluating it. Um, there, there's a lot of um, methodology out there already. I'm a statistician that they can readily draw upon in order to evaluate. And I would say scientifically uh, conducted surveys after be, be the best thing where people can, you can, you can ask, did they vote, whatever. Okay, thank you. We're gonna go this way. Ms. Feinberg, you're oh, next. Great, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I think after the vote by mail, there will be, should be numerous town meetings, not just at City Hall, but at our community centers and across the different places within our city so that we can ask questions and people have opportunity to respond where they are. Uh, we need to hear from the Board of Supervisors elections. We need to hear from every candidate, his or her um, experience in going through the vote by mail as a candidate. I think there will need to be many changes to our existing ordinance. For example, the current ordinance says that the votes have to be received by November 5th. I believe that needs to be changed to postmarked. The number of people who are confused by that and potentially the number of ballots that will not be counted uh, is yet to be determined. So that's just part of the things I think we will need to look at very seriously. Thank you, Mr. Perkins. So the main judgment will be on whether turnout increases or not, the number of voters increases. Um, I'm all for any effort to try and engage the public more. Um, I like data too. I did a little analysis on the voter database and saw that of the people who took part in one of the last two or both of the last two municipal elections, 75% were 60 years or older this year. Um, that's an incredible failure to me on behalf of the city and on behalf of myself and other candidates who can't get younger people excited enough to take part. And by younger, I mean somebody who's 45. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ms. Ashton. Um, so in our city, we have about 15% of the people who are currently voting and um, very, very important decisions get made by 7,000 people. And I know that we have many more that we wanna hear from. I would take a data-driven approach, both quantitative and qualitative. I would look at the audience segments. Did we increase the voting by young working families, by youth? Um, did we increase districts? Are we seeing folks that um, may not have been able to get to their polling place? Um, did we also look at what issues need to be resolved? I would also do a survey to see what people thought about and what we can improve to make it easier for folks to understand the dates and all the, the new rules that were in place. Um, and then I would also look at, did we get non-voters to consider voting? Thank you. Ms. Patty Griffith? Well, I love looking at our voted data. It's what I've been using to go through every street in Rockville. And we've mapped it out and we look and I see, and often when my friends have gone out walking with me, they're like, doesn't this person vote? Doesn't that person vote? And I'm like, they haven't voted in the last three Rockville elections. So I'm really hoping that those people are gonna vote. And I think the first and foremost thing that we're gonna look at, I think I imagine the county's gonna look at it, the state's gonna look at it, because this has never been done anywhere in the state of Maryland before. And we're gonna look at how many more people voted and we're gonna look at who voted and the ages they voted. All that's out there now and I hope to see great improvements in that. I have to say, the two voters that popped out of their doors and said, I'm from Oregon, we love voting by mail. I was very excited to meet them and talk uh, to them in depth about that because they were very supportive and I hope that we will be as supportive, but we definitely need to analyze it. Written public comments, public meetings, and I'll even do an online town hall to talk to people because I want everyone to talk to me. Thank you very much. Mr. Hedger. Uh, I'm a strong supporter of vote by mail. I think it's going to be a big success. Uh, like some other folks mentioned, the ways we need to evaluate it is if people think the government is more responsive and more representative after it happens. All right, that's going to include turnout. It's going to include turnout amongst particular different groups, particularly for me, as he said, young folks. I've got a two-hour commute and two kids in child care. It's kind of hard for me to get out to the polls sometimes. So I like the idea of voting by mail. I like the option to be able to do it in my house, look through the candidates and see what happens. So I think we do need to have an evaluation process. We need to go outside. We need to see how it works. We need to talk to folks. Then we need to come back. We need to make the updates to the ordinance, but I think it's going to be a big success. Okay, hey, thank you very much, and Mr. Miles. I've truly been inspired by what Rockville is doing. You probably hear I have a Southern accent, right? I grew up in Atlanta, and we saw what happened in Georgia in that election. 
Uh, when there's so, been so many efforts to restrict voting from particular people, it's, it's very inspiring that Rockville would do something like this to bring more people to the process. I don't even get off for election day. So, you know, to ask others to do so is, is um, a great, great ask. Um, I'm also inspired by the number of youth who have been participating. Parents say, I have an 18-year-old who's so excited to vote. Um, so I'm, I'm very inspired about that. In terms of, I, I agree with all the things in terms of looking at data afterwards. One of the issues brought up was uh, people's perception of its safety, uh, the integrity of the ballot. So I also would, would want to add people's perceptions of the safety as well as do actual checks. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, one more question before we go to closing statements. This is from um, the audience. We have an explosive deer overpopulation problem. Do you believe the city must call the herd? If not, how do you propose to control the population based on science? Hmm. I think we'll start with Mr. Perkins this time. I think I've talked to this person. Um, I don't know if the city should be in the business of culling the herds. The county is in the business of culling the herds, and they're doing it at the parks. They close parks down, and, and police sharpshooters get their practice um, mm. in culling herds. Um, the scientific way to help reduce population, it's possible to um, provide um, birth control to female deer. We could look into that in terms of price. I don't know how feasible it is, personally. Okay, thank but you. Deer, deer leave my house alone and, and go to Steve's because <laughs> <laughs> he's got better plants. Thank you very much. We'll go this way, Ms. Feinberg. Thank you very much. Uh, the mayor and council have considered the issue of deer culling over the past year or two. Everyone on the current council voted in support of deer culling, and I count myself among those. We did look at sterilization. We heard from experts from the Department of Natural Resources and other places. Unfortunately for Bambi, even if you sterilize once, and it's about $1,500, $1,600 per application, you have to do it again in about two years. So unfortunately, it's not an effective way to, to uh, limit the uh, deer. The deer are starving right now. There are just too many. Uh, per the density. In addition, the number of vehicular and deer accidents grows every year. So yes, I definitely would support deer culling as a pilot program, and we are in the midst of waiting from staff to hear about the plan. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Prashela. I've pursued this issue on the council since 2009. We've had, I think, around anywhere from seven to 10 lengthy mayor and council uh, items on deer control. The only thing that could possibly work is culling. I hate to say it. Um, you know, other methods just are not reliable. They're too expensive, too hard. But I even culling is. I'm not going to hold out a whole lot of hope because you you have to have space even for bow and arrow. You have to have um, you know repeated uh, applications. Uh, you know, and and even getting people in who would perform the culling. You know, that's, that, that's not a sure thing, but we're going to have a pilot. We're going to try it out, and there's going to be a whole education process. Uh, but it's, it's been an issue since before 2009. Thank you. Mr. Miles. This is an issue I'm really torn on. Um, as people know in my family, I'm the weird one. I haven't eaten meat in 16 years. You get this big without eating meat, believe it or not. Um, on the other hand, I'm a pediatrician. I see kids come in with a swollen knee. I test for Lyme. It pops positive. We know that deer can be a reservoir for Lyme. I don't know on this one. I'll, I'll be quite honest. I'm, I'm still figuring it out. I think we do have to address the issue that there are a lot of them. People's cars hit them. I was scared driving home from Carroll County when I used to work up there, um, particularly during this time of year. Um, I'm interested in learning about humane ways to call. I, I don't know if those exist, but I'm certainly open to those. But I'm, I'll be honest. I'm just torn on this one. I, I know that we do need to make a decision. I'll, I'll leave it. I'm, I'm going to learn on this one. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Hedrick. Uh, this is one of the issues I've heard not only in every neighborhood, I think people have deer problems. The, the overpopulation is true. They're a traffic hazard. They are a disease hazard in many cases. Um, we do need to cull the deer population. We do need to have a controlled and active culling population. I'm concerned because the deer live in the neighborhoods, 
so when we have the people go out they need to be trained they need to be monitored we need to have oversight of them doing that and then we do need to call the population because it's not only bad for us for the traffic for the disease it's also bad for the deer they are starving out there i've got pictures from when i'm going around knocking on doors these deer don't look good all right so i think a controlled call is what's something we need to look into Okay, thank you, Ms. Cardi Griffith. The first blog post I wrote for Rockville Central back in 2007 was called Oh Deer because it was a problem then and it's still a problem now. And I know a lot of people love the deer and we're never really going to get rid of the deer. That's close to impossible, but we do need to do some calling because the experts have told us that these are not healthy deer and you can see that. And if we have a really bad winter, I really don't want the eight or ten deer that are in my backyard all the time to be starving to death in my backyard. Uh, so uh, we, we do have to take action. I. When I first got my motorcycle license, I asked one of my friends on Fire and Rescue what was the last accident he'd gone to, and he told me that the motorcyclist had died because they hit a deer. And that hadn't been something that I was even considering of the dangers of getting my motorcycle license, but um, we, we do need to keep people safe and keep the deer safe and have the forest cover because our forest is not going to rejuvenate. Thank you, Ms. Ashton. So I actually had a, an instance with a deer where it jumped out in front of my car. It was very startling. I was worried about the deer. I pulled over for 10 minutes. And um, there's some there are creatures that I love to look at. I think they're beautiful. Um, I do think that for their own benefit and for our community that we do need to think about management. Um, I have been reading on this topic, anticipating that you know a lot of folks in this community. I, in Woodley, I see that sometimes there are populations of nine or 10 walking around. Um, I would, I would like to further explore sterilization as an, as an opportunity. I think there's some new medications coming out that last six years. Um, and then I would also look to the experts to advise in terms of, you know, what's the best way to manage them. I do know that if you overcall, they, they, they sometimes will reproduce at a higher rate. So I want to make sure we don't inadvertently create a higher population. Okay. Thank you very much. That's the last word on deer. Uh, <laughs> we're going to have 60 minute closing statements and we'd like, sorry, 60 second closing <laughs> statement. No, they don't want to be up here. <laughs> we would like to hear from the candidates um, why they want your vote and how they will serve your community. We'll start with Mr. Hedrick and we'll go down this way. So Mr. Hedrick, you're first, 60 seconds. All right. Hi, my name is James Hedrick. I'm up here asking for your vote for Rockville City Council. I think there's two reasons for that. As I mentioned tonight, I'm a father of two, and I'm also a career civil servant. I have a background in housing and economic development. I think I can bring a lot of that experience here to Rockville. We've got a lot of young families that live in Rockville that have one to two hour commutes to DC, uh, down to Virginia. I think we can do a lot more with economic development to bring jobs into our city. All right, my wife works in King Farm. Her commute's 15 minutes. Uh, I work in D.C. My commute's an hour plus every day. I'd like to see my kids more often. All right. And so Rachel and I chose to move to Rockville. I want to use some of my experience to make that opportunity available to other people as well. All right. My kids are going to grow up here. They're going to go to the Rockville schools. This is going to be their hometown. I want to help build a community for them that they can live in now and for decades into the future. All right. So I'm James Hedrick. I'd like you to vote for me for Rockville City Council. Thank you, Ms. Cody Griffith. I'm Cynthia Cotty Griffiths, and I, I think when you elect someone new to council, you have to be able to trust them. And you can trust me. You know me. I've been in the public eye for a long time. During the past, past dozen years, I've publicly written about most of Rockville's issues and promoted all the best things about this city. I have a strong record of involvement in City Hall and over a decade on city commissions for traffic and, and social services. And um, I'm tried and true. Um, I've proven that I can be fair to everyone and that I can create a civic space where everyone can have differing opinions. And Rockville has been an excellent place for us to raise our sons. They are Gen Y and Gen Z, and I want to dedicate myself to making this a place for our youngest generations and create the technology and healthcare jobs they want. Plus, many of you, I want to be able to afford to live here in retirement with my husband. We would like to be able to stay here, and I know a lot of people are struggling with that. I brought affordable housing to the city of Rockville before I ever lived here with Montgomery Housing Partnership, and I will do that, bring more. Thank you very much, Ms. Ashton. Thank you, I'm Monique Ashton. I uh, chose Rockville after a lot of research um, to look at what's the best place to live in the US. I, I researched it for quite a bit of time, and um, I want to preserve what's great about Rockville in terms of um, the neighborhood centers, the people that we meet, um, the strong schools is something that I think uh, we need to be mindful of. 
Um, I think that this election is about the future of Rockville. And what you need most is a candidate who's going to consider the views of the folks they represent, that's going to work hard and do their homework. I know that you're not expecting for someone to know all the answers, but someone who is going to pursue them and to work with you as a partner. Um, I have a very strong background in uh, business. I'm a senior vice president of the company, so I manage uh, contracts. And I think that um, some of that work and the business acumen can be brought and serve the city. I'm also a strong community advocate. And I, when I get an issue or something is happening here, I'm going to see it through the end. I don't believe that any job is not my job. I'm going to work for you. Thank you. Mr. Perkins. Yeah, thanks. Um, I've spent the last 25 years working in some of the America's most challenged neighborhoods. I do community-based crime prevention uh, and have learned when cities do well, how they do well, and seen lessons of failure. Um, but also learning from being a coach for 15 years in this city, connecting to hundreds of families, the power of community, the power of relationships, and that is how cities succeed. When the people feel a part of something, are active in it, are valued, uh, and I see challenges ahead for Rockville, and I wanna be the advocate, the instigator uh, for people becoming part of the solution. Uh, so my goal is to get elected and to work much, much harder for you as a council member than I have campaigning, and that's pretty hard. <laughs> thank, thank you, you very much. Ms. Feinberg. Sure, thank you. I'm Beryl Feinberg, and I have had the honor and privilege of serving as your council member for two terms. I come with a vast experience both academically as well as in my career. I possess an MBA as well as a master's in library science and was a librarian in a former life. Uh, I have had the privilege of having three decades of proven public policy experience as well as 14 years at the county's Office of Management and Budget. I often joke that the budget of the city, which is $138 million on the operating side, was the size of the budget that I managed as Deputy Director as the Department of General Services was the same $138 million. But while at OMB, I worked on a $5.7 billion budget. There are still things that I want to do on this mayor and council, and I hope that I will be elected. When you receive candidate materials, what I would ask you to do, people are saying that they have many goals in affordable housing. Check out the actual action plans behind them. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Prashea. I would like to thank the League of Women Voters and also Channel 11 for such a wonderful uh, forum. I have represented you fairly and forthrightly now for almost eight years. I bring budgetary, economic, and environmental sense to the council. I provide the steady and reasoned voice. I think strategically about our future, but I also challenge a conventional wisdom and sometimes I upset an awful lot of people doing that. I have provided quick reaction on two big issues. I and Virginia Onley led the I-270 awareness campaign in 2018. On the council, I led the opposition to the bus depots. I have walked the city once and I've biked it four times. Nobody has the visual on the city that I do. The big issues for me for the for next term will be to invigorate town center. I'm all about prosperity. I'm not afraid of prosperity, sustainability for the city. I think we really do need more council members. Since 1888, we've had four council members and a mayor. That is when we had a few hundred uh, people in the city. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Miles. Thank you for your time. My name is David Miles. Serving others is the underlying principle guiding my professional life as a pediatrician or in the Navy, and is the reason I want to serve you as a Rockville City Council member. As I mentioned to the thousands of people I've met thus far while canvassing, I'm running for this seat for the same three reasons I moved here. First, we have a 15-month-old. I moved here from this, for the schools, and that's, that's not no big secret. I do want the mayor and council to work better with our county council and school board to make sure we have enough seats in actual classrooms as opposed to portables. Second, we like walking to town center, although I found that many streets are difficult to pass in a car, much less on foot, so I do want to improve street safety throughout Rockville. Third, I came here with a VA home loan as a pediatrician and struggled to afford to live here. I'm worried about, you know, young families, seniors, and others who are trying to make Rockville home and want to improve affordability throughout. 
In summary, I want, hope to earn your vote so that we can build a Rockville that works for everyone. My name is David Miles. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, this concludes the council candidates portion. Sorry, this concludes the council candidates portion of tonight's forum. Up next, the mayoral candidates will take the stage. And as we take a break to prepare, here are some election news from Rockville 11. Rockville will make history in 2019 and become the first city in Maryland to conduct a vote-by-mail election. And Rockville's Board of Supervisors of Elections has the task of ensuring that voters have confidence in this new process. The BSE is a five-member body appointed by the Mayor and Council. They are charged with conducting all city elections and stands by its mission to conduct fair and open elections that are safe and secure, protect the integrity of your vote, and maintain a transparent, accurate, and efficient election process. The Board of Supervisors of Elections wants Rockville voters to rest assured that the vote-by-mail process will be easy, convenient, safe, and secure for this year's election and for future elections. preparing to make political history by conducting its first vote-by-mail election. And the City Clerk, Director of Council Operations, along with the Board of Supervisors of Elections, takes another step to make sure that this election is easy, convenient, safe, and secure. The 24-7 vote-by-mail drop box has been installed at Rockville City Hall. Remember, Election Day is Tuesday, November 5th. And this election, you can mail your ballot in, drop your ballot in the secure drop box, or you can even come to the Vote Center on Election Day from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. at City Hall. Ballots are being mailed to all registered Rockville voters between October 6th and 12th. If you don't register by the deadline, on Election Day, you can still register and vote at City Hall. For more information on the 2019 vote by mail election, head to rockvillemd.gov slash election. Welcome back to Rockville 11's first televised candidate forum hosted by the League of Women Voters of Montgomery County. I'm your moderator. I'm Diane Habino, co-president of the League. And now joining us on stage are the two candidates for Rockville mayor. We will use the same format which was used during the council candidate portion. Without further ado, the candidates are, and please hold your applause till the end, the candidates are Ms. Bridget Donnell Newton and Ms. Virginia Onley. Okay, so we'll start with the questions and I think We've had a variety of questions, but we would like to hear from the mayoral candidates this time. So can you tell us about the town center and its dilemma in that there is turnover, there might be um, some housing needs? Who should be responsible for moving forward in the town center? Should it be businesses? Should it be the city of Rockville? Um, what is your opinion about the town center and how to keep it as a source of pride for the city? Ms. Newton. 
Uh, thank you very much for the question, and thank you to the League of Women Voters and Channel 11 for hosting this. Congratulations on your 100-year anniversary. Um, the Town Center is the People's Center. It's for everyone, and when I learned that Dawson's was closing, I immediately convened a town hall so that everybody could come together and talk about what was going on. It's a partnership that we have to have among all our stakeholders. It's the community. It's the government, it's all the property owners in the town center area following that meeting. Um, actually, the city commissioned a ULI study through a TAP grant with the um, Council of Governments, and we also, um, well, I asked Ready to Help, and they brought together, they convened a stakeholders group of the major property owners in the town center to help us. Thank you. Ms. Onley? Well, first of all, we need to address the density, because if you have businesses, and you don't have the population or the residents in those areas to support the businesses you have, it's always going to fail. So what I would like to do is just get all stakeholders to the table to figure out what will work and to figure out a way to increase the density of town centers so that we have more people to patronize uh, the businesses and also to address the parking issue because that is another problem that deters people from coming to Rockville Town Center. Okay, thank you. Talking about cars and transit, I will ask again your opinion about the I-270 expansion or widening plan. Do you agree with the governor's managed toll lane idea? And how should expansion take place? Will it affect property by Rockville um, citizens? What would be your input as to how to resolve this problem of traffic versus people and property in the city of Rockville. Ms. Onley. Well, as um, Councilmember Prashela said, him and I were on the forefront of fighting against the widening of I-270. But the problem is that we need mass transit. We haven't put enough focus on that. And as mayor, I will work with the county and the state so that we have transit because people don't want to lose their properties. And I was glad that um, there were so many people who helped us fight against it. We met right here at the senior center. We had 100 people and did 5,000 mailing pieces. Thank you, Ms. Newton. As you can see, it's difficult for me to say when I've done something, it just, um, it's not my nature, but I too was instrumental in the 270 conversations. I'm the former chair of the Washington Metropolitan Regional Transportation Planning Board, which is a stakeholders group throughout the whole DMV talking about how we are going to grow this area and provide for the opportunities of everyone to be here. Uh, transportation is a key issue. I am very disappointed in the governor's plan. However, um, what we are, um, pleased with is that the current plan set, excuse me, says it won't go outside of the right-of-way. That's one good thing. I don't believe in tolls, never have. All you have to do is look at Indiana and Illinois to see what a failure they've been. Um, so I think we need to continue the conversation. It's about continuing to work with our stakeholders at all levels. Okay. Moving on to another uh, subject, we have a question from the audience that says, what is your position for decreasing homelessness? We'll start with you, Ms. Newton. What is my position? Mm -hmm. No, um, your ideas for decreasing homelessness. Thank you, because um, I would certainly hope we would decrease it. Um, there are a lot of things that I think we can do um, when, and, and I serve on the interagency coalition for, to end homelessness for the county and the city. Um, it's important that we understand the reasons for homeless. Um, this, it's not just that people aren't affording, there are mental illness problems, there are surrounding issues um, in terms of um, services that need to be. So I would like to see more intensity put into group homes where people have surround services. Um, I think the Coalition for Homelessness is doing a good job in getting those um, home centers throughout the county. Uh, the city is about to um, embark upon a plan with the county for a 100-bed men's emergency shelter. We'll go on Taft Court in an empty building that we currently own to help throughout the winter. Thank you very much. Ms. Onley. Well, housing affordability is something that I have been working on for years. 
and part of the homelessness, I remember when I volunteered at one of the shelters in the city, uh, we were, I was preparing meals. So I had to put a couple of meals aside for people who worked at the mall. These people had full-time jobs but could not afford a place to live. So in working with development as it comes online, housing affordability is really what we need. And I will continue to work on that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have a question about uh, Georgetown Hill. Georgetown Hill and Woodley, Woodley Gardens caught fire in January, causing the owner of the pool and property not to open the pool. The property is zoned R90 and could be sub subdivided into single family homes. However, the neighborhood has expressed a strong desire to keep the pool open. Will you work with the community to support our initiative to open the pool rather than side with developers? This is from Woodley Gardens. Miss um, Onley. Okay, absolutely, because I believe that that pool is one of Rockville's gems. And as an elected official, we should do everything we can. And as mayor, I will lead working with the community. I've spoken to a couple of residents, and I know that they really want that pool to come back. And it's also important uh, for me to get them back up and running. Okay, thank you. Ms. Newton? Um, absolutely. I'll continue to work with uh, the neighborhood. Fred and I lived on Azalea Drive when we were first married, uh, so I'm very familiar with what an asset um, the Woodley Gardens pool is to the community. I, I think there are a lot of ways that the city can once again partner. And those are the, the opportunities that we have as a government. It's to be helpful. Um, and I think it would be an unbelievable win, not just for the Woodley Gardens, College Gardens neighborhood, but if you look at Twinbrook and the pool in Twinbrook, maybe there are other ways that we can spread some of the benefits out throughout the city and not just have the municipal pool be the place that everybody gathers, but have neighborhood pools supported as well. well. Okay, moving to school issues. The question is, what should you do, or you and the council, to move MCPS, Montgomery County Public Schools, to address overcrowding in Rockville schools? What is your opinion, and do you have ideas of how to work with MCPS on the overcrowding problem? I think you are the first one, Ms. Newton. Sure, thank you. Um, I've been working with MCPS for quite a few years now. I was the first one out on the Rockville Council to talk about elementary school number five, pushing very hard for them to build it to 740 instead of their plan 620. Bayard Rustin opened a year ago, and this year they have 730 students. So if you imagine that they build it at 620. Um, I think it's important that once again, I, I keep repeating about partnerships, but we cannot go around bashing our surrounding jurisdictions and our partners. We have to work with them. And there are good ways to do that. It's about building that understanding that they have a job to do. Rockville is one of their jurisdictions, and we win when we work with them. Great schools build great neighborhoods, and great neighborhoods support great schools. Thank you. Ms. Onley? Uh, I will continue to work and partner with Montgomery County Public Schools and Montgomery County. We have a champion project that's coming online, Twinbrook Quarter. The impact fees from that development will really help us with the school issue, but we need to look at that more and make sure that we stay engaged as a governing body so that we get the proper schools that we need for our children. Okay, thank you. Um, here's another question. Um, we would like to know, because one of you will be mayor and you manage a team, not only of county council, but of departments. And we'd like you to describe your leadership style and perhaps give us some examples of this style. Ms. Onley. Okay. You want me to describe my leadership style? Yes. Okay. Um, with this campaign, I hired a campaign manager. And she said to me, you're one of the best managers I've ever had because when something needs to be done or something needs to be addressed, you address it. You don't shy from it, 
but you also supply the tools that the individuals need to get their job done. And I speak softly, but I carry a big stick. So I really, um, my style of management is easy, but it's very serious, and I expect employees to get their job done. Thank you. Ms. Newton. Well, I need to correct one thing that you said. I'm sorry, Diane, but the mayor doesn't have any kind of power, really. Um, the mayor and council have three uh, appointed officials, the attorney, the clerk, and the manager who report to the five. So it really takes collaboration. Mm -hmm. It takes leadership. It takes a willingness to listen and partner with everyone to sort of come up with the direction that the city is going to go. Most of the employees in the city work under the city manager. They do not work under the mayor and council. And therefore, it's up to the mayor and council to say to the city manager, we'd really like to do this and to have the manager then get, you know, if the manager agrees with that, I guess, but get that vision mm -hmm. going with his staff or her staff. Okay. So continuing on this vein, can you think of an instance or an experience with where you've had great difficulty in working with an individual or with an individual office, and how did you resolve the situation? I'm talking about in the workplace um, or maybe in the public. Ms. Newton. That's a very interesting question, especially these days. Um, I think it's about communication and trust and respect. Um, I have tried very much to be a, um, a collaborator and willing to listen and learn. I certainly don't think I'm the sharpest tool in the shed. And so I have frequently said, could we go to lunch? Can we talk about something? Um, I believe in humor. I don't have a great sense of humor. I've been told, but I always like to be around people who do um, because I think humor can add to the conversation and sort of cut the tension a little bit. So um, I believe that I'm a consensus builder. Um, and I believe in asking people their opinion and then trying to come up with an agreement. So you didn't really answer the question about a difficult situation where you've no. had to use your sense of humor or your... Um, I, I think if you watch yeah. enough meetings, you'll know how hard I try <laughs> to keep civility in the conversation and to not go, um, you know, as Michelle Obama said, when they go low, I go high. Thank you. Ms. Onley. Actually, I've had quite a few because I worked at IBM and uh, led a lot of projects. But um, I remember I had a situation where every time we had a project team meeting, the individual would um, think of some excuse to end the meeting. And someone said to me, you know, she, she always blows up and ends the meeting. And I can't figure out what it is. So I had a conversation with her, and it was a very unusual conversation. She was a smoker, and so, and she would cause confusion to get out of the meeting. So then I started to schedule more breaks for the meeting so that she could support her habit and we could get something done. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, now it comes to the closing statements by each of you. Um, I believe, Ms. Newton, you were number one, so you'll speak first, 60 seconds. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. It has been my honor and privilege to serve the city, both as a council member and as a mayor. I would humbly ask for your vote uh, one more time. I, too, feel that we are on the cusp of some very good things in Rockville. I love our city, and I love the potential. Um, I see Redgate and King Farm and Town Center as opportunities for us to come together and do really good things. I want to correct a statement that was made earlier. Dawson's is not closing. Um, that's old news, and uh, I think it's at least a year and a half old, so please don't um, spread that around. It's not true. Um, but that speaks to some things that are happening right now. There are things that are being said that aren't true, and I respectfully beg you to ask the candidates there um, and give them the out, give us the opportunity to actually tell you what we think and what we're saying about things so that you are hearing directly from us. So I thank you um, for the possibility of having your vote, and I look forward to speaking with you. Thank you. Ms. Onley. Well, I hope you learned a little bit more about me today, and I hope you can answer for yourself one simple question. What kind of mayor do you want for Rockville? 
Are you looking for someone who is ready to lead, be upfront with you, and values your opinion? If so, then I'm asking for your vote to work together to create a Rockville that is installed by business as usual or driven to be better, but driven to be better. Even before I joined the council, I've been a positive change in Rockville. My commitment to strengthening neighborhoods and bringing out the best in all of us will move our city forward. I'm asking for your vote, and I hope you will support Team Rockville, leaders who bring institutional knowledge and fresh ideas to the table. Together, we create new economic opportunities for the city. Together, we protect our communities from harmful development. Together, we can all have a voice. Together, we are Rockville. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give a hand to all the candidates. Thank you. And to Rockville 11 and to all the volunteers who worked here, remember, ballots will be mailed on or before October 11th. If you have not received your ballot, please call the clerk's office if you have not received it in one week by October 18th. All ballots must be received, not postmarked, received by 8 p.m. on Tuesday, November 5th. If you wish to submit your ballot in person, there will be a drop box outside of City Hall. If for some reason you did not register to vote in time, there will be same day registration from 8 a.m. Sorry, from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. on November 5th. And you know that the next forum, as seen in the newspaper, is uh, Wednesday, October 2nd at the Thomas Farm Community Center in, on Falls Grove Drive from 1 to 2.30 p.m. Thank you very much for coming. Good night.